As Western sanctions take a toll on Russia's economy, it's looking elsewhere for markets and finding a welcome partner in China. With trade between the two countries surging, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says he sees inexhaustible potential in their relationship. Can new commercial ties with China compensate for the ones severed by the West? Could and would Beijing seek to influence Russia's war on Ukraine? Does China hold the cards? That's our question today. Hello and welcome to To The Point. Here are our guests. Felix Lee writes about the global economy for the Berlin-based daily newspaper, The Tats, and previously served as the paper's China correspondent. Matthew Karnichnig is Politico's chief Europe correspondent and based here in Berlin. And Natalia Smolenseva is a colleague working with DW News and also with DW's Russia desk, and she formerly worked in our Moscow bureau. Felix, some uh, people, both in China and Russia, have been using some pretty flowery rhetoric to describe these new ties. Uh, in fact, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesman recently called it a model for the world. What does he mean by that exactly? And how would you assess the significance uh, of this bond? Well, of course, China wants to take advantage of the conflict and tries to like uh, or show uh, the new friendship and officially outwardly of course china is not uh, is not following the western sanctions uh, china blames the nato for uh, for the war for the escalation but interesting when you look deep uh, there are no more more uh, more ties uh, also economically speaking of course china uh, imports a little bit more gas because gas from Russia now is cheap. Uh, but if you look at the financial sector or the technology uh, where Russia hopes to get the more technology from China, there's not much happening. Uh, I see that a lot of uh, Chinese tech firms actually are leaving Russia because uh, for them, of course, the Western market is more important than the Russian and they are afraid that uh, that my, the U.S. and the Western countries would uh, sanctionize also Chinese companies if they have too close ties to Russia. And I want to come back uh, to that a little bit later. Matthew, China and Russia announced uh, this new friendship as the uh, Winter Olympics were getting underway in Beijing, and they talked about it there as a no-limits partnership. Do you take that at face value, or do you expect that China would, under certain circumstances, seek to influence Russia's actions in Ukraine? Well, it's worth remembering that both of these countries are, are very skilled in the art of propaganda and have a very long history of, of using it to their advantage. And I think that China wouldn't hesitate to try and influence uh, Russia if it, if it saw fit. And I think at, at this meeting, it was clear that Putin sought a green light uh, from Xi or told him what he uh, had in mind for Ukraine and that the Chinese leadership agreed to it, thinking, as Putin did, that it would be a very uh, quick operation and that after a few days they would all be celebrating uh, victory. That, of course, hasn't come to pass. Natalia, not long ago, China and Russia actually conducted joint military exercises. How concerned should the West be about these ties? Well, I think these military exercises, as, as well as what we're hearing from Lavrov, are the signs uh, actually to the Western audiences, to the outside world, that Russia is now switching to the East, switching to China. We don't need your, you know, Western trade. We are well off without it. We have Chinese uh, partners. But if we look in how this message comes down to the domestic audiences, it's a totally different story. I think people in Russia are not um, considering themselves... Um, you know, um, very, very close ties with China. Uh, there's never been this idea that Russia is an Eastern country, Eastern power. There's 
uh, either Russia is with the West or Russia is by its, uh, by its own. So I don't think it comes down really good in the domestic audience that we now, China is our main friend and partner. I think people are very much afraid of the Chinese influence there and what it can bring, that uh, the assets that are going to be cheap in Russia are now being bought by the Chinese companies or something like that. And then if China will rely 100% um, on, on, if Russia will rely 100% on China, that will be new dependence for it. Felix, what do we know about how the Chinese people see this this relationship? Do they welcome the new friendship with Russia? Not really. There Traditionally, there was never big trust between these two countries. Uh, in Soviet times, uh, Russia, although they're supposed to be sisters' countries, uh, uh, but uh, Moscow looked down on Beijing and uh, Mao Zedong couldn't bear it and that's why they broke. There, there was a big broke in their relationship and this mistrust, distrust is still happening. So, I mean, China's wanting, trying to take advantage of the conflict, but there is no real close ties and no trust. Uh, Actually, China had, had, had a big project in Central Asia with the new Silk Road. And interesting, it wasn't going so much through Russia. They uh, were focusing on the other countries, Kazakhstan and Ukraine. And uh, this plan is not working anymore with this war happening. So actually, if you look close, China is not too happy that uh, this war is lasting for already so long and who knows uh, until it ends. Trade between China and Russia had, in fact, uh, been on the rise even prior to the announcement at the Winter Olympics. Uh, but the fact is, this is no partnership of equals. China is by far Russia's most important trading partner. Moscow sends out a fifth of its export volume to China. But it is not among China's top 10 trading partners. This doesn't seem to bother Russia's foreign minister. Eurasia is becoming the most promising region in the world. We must take advantage of this development. And we should not rely on the US dollar or SWIFT, but develop our own payment systems. However, Europe and the US are the main buyers of Chinese goods. So Beijing is trying not to alienate such important trading partners by showing too much support for Putin's war against Ukraine. Were Europe or the US to impose economic sanctions on China, the top world exporter would lose billions. And when money is at stake, Beijing's friendship with Putin evidently has limits. Is the Russian-Chinese alliance just for show? Let me pass that question straight on uh, to Matthew. And, uh, you know, it, it's clear what Russia is hoping to get from this relationship. But what's in it for China? Well, one thing that's in it is, is cheap energy. And, and this is really something that uh, is, is worth remembering, that uh, China needs energy from outside of, of China in order to feed its economy. It has an insatiable appetite for oil and gas, which Russia has in, in large quantities. And I think this is something that China will want from Russia for, for many decades to come. I, don't think they want to make themselves dependent on Russia in the same way some countries in, in Europe have done, not to name any names. But uh, this is certainly a role that Russia will continue to play for China and also for the West. But that's all that Russia has to offer. And this is Russia's real weakness, is that it's become effectively a gas station for Asia and uh, for especially Europe. Uh, Natalia, China is an energy-hungry country. There is no doubt about that. But the fact, uh, isn't it a fact that there are limits to the degree which Chinese energy imports can actually compensate for the cutoff of uh, Western uh, 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 imports? Yeah, that's true. And here are several points. Uh, first of all, because of the war, the prices have gone up. And this is also not very good for China or any other country that wants to buy a lot of energy. For Russia, 
um, Europe was a big market, so I don't think China or China and India or any other countries together will can compensate for amount of energy. Uh, well, now we're talking about the oil that we already have a ban on it, but I think the gas uh, still discussing may be coming in next um, month or a year. Um, it won't compensate 100% um, for the losses um, in this regard. Uh, also, the cost of transporting um, oil to or, or gas, for that matter, to um, other countries are higher because um, oil, oil tanker can reach European Union in like four days, five days, whether to go to China or India will be 40 days. So it's like 10 times as um, as long journey, 10 times as much ships and the costs will rise. And I think these countries um, will see this as an opportunity and will ask Russia for discounts for gas. So in that sense, I don't think Russia will actually gain something. It will gain new markets, but I don't think it will gain economically from that. And let me ask you about uh, Russian tech imports, because those have actually been, precisely because the Russian industrial economy is underdeveloped, Russian Russians have been importing a lot of high-tech products from the West. Can China make up for that? Well, I think Russia is actually looking to China and other Asian countries like South Korea to uh, fill this gap because um, technology, a lot of technology in Russia is from the West and this is a serious issue. It's an issue for many industries, like from uh, for the aircrafts, for instance, and for many plants. So I think there is big hopes um, looking at China, but um, as we've already talked about, some companies, some tech companies are also leaving Russia, not announcing this big, but for instance, Huawei is closing the shops and some other companies, Chinese companies, are not delivering their tech products to Russia. Maybe they don't do this as uh, Western countries really shutting the door and saying, we're going away, like McDonald's did. But um, they're also seeing this as the um, risk market for them, so I think business interests might prevail here. Let's talk about that, uh, Felix, because verbally, at least, China has rejected the Western sanctions, but it seems that Chinese companies are nonetheless complying with them, and even, as you mentioned, as Natalia mentioned, uh, being proactive about that. So w what's going on, and uh, what's behind that? The simple reason is the Western markets is much, much more important for China than for Russia. Europe and and the U.S. are the two biggest markets for Chinese, um, so they don't want to risk that. So that's a simple and pretty much the reason why. Uh, and Russia is a is is, is 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 a small market. It's sort of a satisfaction for the Chinese government, of course, that uh, uh, the former rival uh, is now getting more and more dependent. But um, Chinese don't want to risk uh, their markets, so the Western market, so that's a simple reason. Uh, Matthew, as the war began, predictions were rife that it would spur a new division of the world into Cold, era sty Cold War era style trading blocks. Do you think that is what's happening here? And how far does that division actually go? I don't think it is happening. I think what's happening is that Russia has become very isolated and it's going to depend increasingly on China, on India as well. These are countries that haven't sanctioned Russia. There's no appetite, though, as we've just heard from Mr. Lee, that uh, for, 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 for China to uh, put its relations with other parts of the world at risk or for Chinese companies in, in, in order to continue to supply the Russian market because it's just it's not big enough. It's not interesting enough for them. So I think this is going to be a major challenge for Russia going forward uh, to find countries that are really willing to 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 trade with it no holds barred as as was the case before and let me let, uh, just ask you about something that was mentioned in the film, namely the idea that uh, this China-Russian axis represents a dollar-free zone, as it as it would as it were, and could actually spur the decline of the dollar as a the world's reserve currency. Do you think we're seeing that uh, happening? Uh, the short answer is no. We're, we're not seeing it happen. Uh, again, the, the Russian economy is just much too small to really force that kind of change, even together with the Chinese. Uh, there's too much capital around the world invested 
in dollars. Um, and I, I don't see any any movement in other countries to really want to move away from the dollar, whether in the Middle East or in, in Latin America, certainly not in North America. So, um, you know, I think uh, this is definitely wishful thinking on the part of uh, the Russians. Felix, can you tell us how you see Beijing's trade-offs or the way that it would balance economic as opposed to st strategic considerations. I'm thinking, for example, uh, uh, what it means to China that Ukraine, which, as you mentioned, had been a good trading partner for China, is now uh, having its economy completely destroyed. Is this something that you think China views with equanimity? China's a little bit, of course, not only a little bit is worried because, I mean, uh, wheat production, uh, Ukraine, uh, China's very dependent on wheat imports uh, from all over the world, but, and Ukraine was one of the biggest provider. So this is a big problem. Prices in China also are ri is rising. And this is a risk what the Chinese government maybe at the beginning beginning of the war hasn't thought through, but is now becoming much um, uh, more and more a problem because nothing, the communist leaders, uh, they fear nothing else than social instability. And when prices are rising also in China, uh, that might uh, 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 be a threat also to, to their leadership. So uh, it hasn't been all thought through. Um, but more and more China is getting worried as the longer the, this war lasts. Let's, in fact, take a look at those global implications of Russia's war against Ukraine. It has sent fuel and food prices soaring. A hunger crisis is looming. And the World Bank recently warned of a sharp slowdown in growth with drastic implications for the world economy on which China depends. The oil embargo, for example, has led to higher prices at gas stations and supermarkets in Europe. There is increasing anxiety about uncontrolled inflation. The blockage of Ukrainian grain transport is also causing the cost of bread to rise in Europe and a food crisis in Africa. We are not preventing the export of Ukrainian grain. There are many export routes. Ukraine can export through the Black Sea ports it controls, such as Odessa. Russia is solely responsible for this food crisis, Russia alone, despite the Kremlin's campaign of lies and disinformation. Furthermore, the Russian army has mined many fields in Ukraine and destroyed farms. Who is responsible for the food crisis? Let me pass that question straight on to Natalia, coupled with the question of whether we can believe Russian claims that a sea corridor for grain exports will soon be reopened. Um, so just um, yesterday, um, Russian foreign minister was in Turkey and talked about this, about the possibility of resolving this food situation. And uh, I think for Russia, this food crisis, as well as the war in Ukraine, as well as many other things before, is this battle of narratives, whether Western narrative against Russian narrative, and in Russian narrative, Russia is not responsible for the food crisis, obviously. This is the Ukraine that is not providing uh, the grain. Um, Russia is um, prepared there to, um, to ensure the safety of this. And I think also what Russia is trying to reach out of the situation is the ease of sanctions. They want to trade off uh, this to the um, let us um, let West lift some of the sanctions and then we'll, we'll get the grain pass. And interestingly enough, I think this narrative um, has actually resonated with some of the countries, especially in the African continent, because these are the countries that are actually affected greatly by the food, um, food problem. And um, I think past, last week, the uh, leader of Senegal was in Moscow and met with uh, Putin about um, different issues, but also food security. And I think right now we see in some um, African countries also this narrative coming down that you know, maybe it's not um, only Russia's fault, maybe, you know, the NATO or the, or the way they reacted to, to Russia's aggression is also to blame. So they see it increasingly as, uh, as a narrative competition, so to say, and we'll see if, like, which narrative will win. Actually. And let's get Matthew's take on that, on which narrative will win. It's the famous battle for hearts and minds. And if we look at the United Nations General Assembly vote uh, on the war in Ukraine, there were a number of countries that abstained uh, and or even voted uh, against uh, condemning Russia. 
Non a number of them will be affected by grain shortages and fuel price rises. Uh, uh, what do you think? Well, I think I think when people are, are, are facing uh, a famine, um, you know, they'll do whatever they need to in order to to get to grain. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't know who's responsible here. And I, I think it's 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 pretty it's pretty simple. It's really not not that complicated. If you accept that Russia started this war without provocation, then you have to accept that Russia is also responsible for the looming grain shortage here. Uh, it could resolve the problem by withdrawing from Ukraine and ending the war, and uh, everything would would open up again. So I understand that African leaders are doing everything they can to to get food for their people and, and ensure uh, grain supplies. But uh, I don't think that uh, the, the president of Senegal or anyone else really believes that uh, Vladimir Putin isn't responsible for this crisis. And do you think there's a short term prospect of grain exports actually going out or do you think these promises on this on the part of Russia are uh, empty? Well, I think this is where, where China could play an important role as well. If they were to use the leverage they have with Moscow to pressure them, and maybe they already are, that could explain these initiatives by Lavrov and, and others to uh, try at least publicly. We don't know if they're serious about it, but uh, if they follow through on this to, to open the ports, to open uh, Odessa in particular to allow grain out of there, um, then I, I think, you know, there, there is a chance that you could at least see some improvement. But you have to remember that much of the grain is still stuck in silos in the interior of Ukraine. It's not in, in the ports. And that could really be the, the major crisis uh, ahead. Mm -hmm. Felix, shortages uh, not only of grain, which you also mentioned would definitely affect China, but also shortages of uh, fuel cooking oil are going to have a major impact in Asia. Do you think all of that will influence China to put pressure on Russia? What circumstances uh, would it take for China to say to Putin, OK, time for this thing to end? Okay, so far there are no signs that China is really playing an active role in uh, a diplomatic role, but I think they are worried, especially other countries who provided oil, uh, they also shut down their markets like Indonesia or, uh, or, or and, and India. A lot of countries are worried that uh, there's so much shortage so they don't export. And um, yeah, so I think... Uh, yes, China might play a more active role, but uh, what they can achieve, I have doubts. Uh, I think the influence, Beijing's influence on Putin, the relationship is not so close that China can make Putin to stop the war. And this would be the only result to also a uh, source of food crisis. As you said, it's not about the, the ports. It's, uh, it's that the whole country is, is, is destroyed by the war. And so only Putin can stop that. And I'm not sure if China is able to uh, make him stop that. Natalia, what do you think? How amenable would Vladimir Putin be to advise? or even pressure from his new friend, Xi? Well, I don't think he will be amenable to any pressure, actually, because I think he's gone very far in this, um, in the war. And I think this Ukraine question, this Ukraine problem, as he himself said, was uh, it's a very core of his worldview and the view of Russia, his envision for himself. So I don't think, um, you know, China's advice or even pressure would uh, make him stop right now without achieving something that he can sell back home as a victory. Because, um, as I said, I think so many red lines have been crossed um, going to this war right now. So now it's you know too late to back up and say, yeah, we don't really mean that. You know, let us be friends together again. I don't think it's possible. Matthew, how could or should the West uh, seek to drive a wedge between China and Russia. And is there any way for the U.S. to use China to get that influence uh, on Putin? Well, I think the use of uh, sanctions or the threat of sanctions against some Chinese sectors, Chinese companies, could be an, an effective tool. But it's a little bit tricky because you would s sort of risk uh, retaliation on, on on the part of the of the Chinese. But I think, generally speaking, that the U.S. can use its very 
deep commercial ties with China to try and nudge the Chinese uh, in, in, in the right direction here. Um, I think that Europe can do the same thing. Certainly, uh, Germany has maybe better relations with China or definitely better relations with China than the United States and also very deep trading relationships. So I think if, if the West in general were to try and convince China that this war is not in China's interest, it's in nobody's interest and they should do whatever they can to uh, push Russia to uh, end the war and, uh, and get out of Ukraine. Felix, I'm hearing companies based here in Germany and elsewhere in Europe saying that they're actually not only reassessing ties to Russia, but also ties to China, not only because of the war, but also because of the new ties with between China and Russia, as well as the lockdowns in Shanghai, the zero COVID policy, and of course, the leak of files on Xinjiang. Do you think that could have an effect on how close China is willing to snuggle with Russia? I'm not sure about that because uh, the problem a lot of German companies also have, uh, China doesn't rely on them so much anymore as it used to be. And uh, you can feel that. Uh, Volkswagen company, long time, very welcome in China, not so welcome anymore because China knows to build better uh, uh, e-vehicles. So I'm not sure. The danger is that uh, I think a lot of German companies realize also with the war in Russia, uh, too dependent on one country, authoritarian country, is a threat and this has to change. Natalia, one word. Our title asked, does China hold the cards? I guess at this point it might be true. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Thanks to you out there for tuning in. See you soon. <laughs>